Okay, hello everyone and welcome to the kickoff event for Planet Women's Colorado River Overflight Project. Um, we are so excited to have all of you here today um, and to see everyone's faces and tell you a little bit more about what we've got cooking up. Some amazing women and participants across the Colorado River Basin from all the way up in the headwaters in the Rockies down to Mexico to the Delta. So uh, to start, I'm actually going to share a welcome, a virtual welcome from Tanya Trujillo, who is the uh, Assistant Secretary of Water and Science for the Department of the Interior. Uh, so I'm gonna let her say hello to you. It'll be a video. Hold on one second so I can share it. So let's hope this works. So Christine or someone tell me if you can't hear it. Hello, and greetings from the world of water and science. I am Tanya Trujillo, the Assistant Secretary for Water and Science at the Department of the Interior. I am very pleased to provide an introduction today and to wish you well during the launching event for the Colorado River Overflight Project. I was excited to hear about this project from the first time that uh, I heard about it and the idea of connecting traditional cultures and the modern world through storytelling from the sky sounds like great fun. I am looking forward to learning more about the projects and the ideas that will evolve from your discussions. Water is life and the Colorado River Basin that has been near and dear to my heart for many years has meant life in the region for many centuries. So hearing about that life through many different ish lenses and perspectives will be an interesting addition to our collective knowledge. One thing we know for sure is that our climate is changing and now more rapidly than ever before. Whether we are thinking about the headwaters in Wyoming or Colorado or the mouth of the Delta in Mexico, we are seeing the changing conditions on the ground every day. And one, way, one great way to see the ground is from the sky. I applaud the goal of working together to develop stories and archives that can help future generations learn about and understand the relationship between the Colorado River and the diverse communities that have evolved around her. This will be an essential work as we uh, develop strategies together to address the challenges of climate change. I applaud the ingenuity of the pilots and organizers who are working together with the other women in the basin to relay the information that incorporates traditional knowledge and the empirical science to set habitat restoration goals and other strategies. Best wishes for the launch event and discussions today and happy skies. Thank you. So that was from Tanya. Um, all right, I would like to introduce our fearless leader at Planet Women, our CEO, Christine Ziegler. Uh, this project is really a combination of all of her passions. She's herself a pilot. Um, she's very close to the desert west and she's published books on it. And she's also a wonderful creative storyteller in her own right. So I'm excited to welcome her. Let her tell you a little bit more about the inspiration for this project. Thank you so much, Jojo, and thank you to the whole team that's helping to launch the Colorado Overflight Project today. Um, I'm here to tell you a little bit about Planet And can you guys hear me okay? Okay, if you're on, uh, if you can mute yourselves, that would be great, then we'll make sure we don't get any feedback. We are gonna record this and share this with partners and try to use it as a recruiting tool for pilots and storytellers and Native American women leaders. I come to you from Walnut Creek, California, which is the homeland of the Bay Miwok and the Yokuts. And yet I've been trapped in my office as many of us have, uh, getting stuff done, done remarkably, remarkably with some amazing women and men and people of all gender identities. I wanna take you to 1987. Some of you were around then. I was renting a little film from our video rental store in Bishop, California called Top Gun. And after I saw that film, uh, watching it on my new VCR, I thought, I'm going to be the first female fighter pilot. I'm going to join the Air Force or the Navy, and I'm going to fly those F-14 Tomcats. So I joined the Civil Air Patrol so that I could learn about being in the military and learn about uh, marching and being a leader. And I worked my way up 
through all the stripes all the way to master sergeant and i even got to go up in a little airplane with our squadron leader and i watched him fly the plane and i thought to myself wow that looks so hard and it sounds so expensive i don't know if i'm really going to be able to do it it just it's out of reach for my family and i don't know if i'll ever have enough money to do it well, I took my first commercial flight when I was 18 years old. I flew from San Diego to Las Vegas, Nevada. I had been selected as teenager of the year and got to attend this very elaborate banquet in Las Vegas with the Academy of Achievement. And one of the evening events, believe it or not, was at the foot of the Hoover Dam at night. Lights were shining down on this group of students who were looking forward to going to college. And our keynote speaker that night was Dolly Parton. And she was wearing her signature wigs and her signature heels so that she could see over the lectern, she said, and see the future is so bright with all of you. She told us about all the obstacles she had overcome and especially being someone who grew up in poverty, she really wanted to tell us that we could hold a lot in our hands if we believed and had faith in ourselves. So I thought about her as I was preparing for today because standing at the foot of the Hoover Dam was a really interesting experience as an 18 year old. It's massive, it's curved, it's beautiful, the ingenuity, the engineering, it's pretty impressive, but I didn't really get it. I didn't really understand how a hydroelectric power dam worked. I didn't really understand why we would want to hold a river back. I didn't get the whole infrastructure deal at all. Come back with me to my childhood. I'm there in the Owens Valley and my dad says to me, oh, I hate those flatlanders. I said, what are flatlanders, dad? He goes, oh, those people from Los Angeles. He hated two things about them. One, he said they drove too fast when they were coming to go fishing and skiing at Mammoth. And two, they stole our water. Well, I couldn't figure this out. How can you steal liquid? How could water from a river that looked so brown and dark and dank to me be drunk and be drunk a couple of hundred miles away? And these experiences really shaped me and got me curious so that as I became an adult and had the agency to actually research and understand the connections between water and infrastructure and dams and people. Everywhere I looked, I saw that it was dry. And yet people in Bishop, especially older farmers or people who remembered the good old days would say it used to be green here, used to be verdant and lush, yet there's sagebrush and Joshua trees. So I became obsessed with all these questions and even wrote a little book of short stories, fictional stories about the water wars before, during, and after those water wars between LA and Los Angeles. Still fascinated by flying, I'm now an adult grown up, and one of my coworkers hooked me up with a freak flight coupon from Cessna.com to go up on a discovery flight to learn about what does it take to become a private pilot. And the person who took me up for my first discovery flight was Maria D'Amato. And she's the reason I'm a pilot today. She saw me all the way through, through several years of training. And in 2013, I became a private pilot. Being able to work on a project with indigenous women leaders and partners in Mexico and California, and to combine aviation with water and conservation and restoration, is so personal and meaningful to me. But the Colorado River is about all of us. And that means all of us in the world, not just in the West. But if you're eating salad in New York in winter, it's because of Colorado River water. If you're consuming movies and scripts and television and Netflix, it's because the city of Los Angeles draws water from the Colorado River. So I find that in this moment of time, we're able to actually marshal all those resources of storytelling, of understanding data and science and, and the dire predictions, of course, during this mega drought, but to use them to tell a different story and to imagine something innovative and healthy and different. And all of us have been coming together 
over time to collaborate for solutions for many, many decades, in fact. We're one of the only animals, I think it's safe to say, who can imagine the future, imagine the problems of that future, and do something about it. And here today are some of those women who are doing something about it now and will continue to do so on, on the part of all of us. I'm really proud to introduce you to Rocio Torres Mohel. She is from the Sonoran Institute. What an amazing leader. She was just named the director of the Colorado River Delta program just this February. She's an expert in sustainable businesses and project development all across Mexico's natural protected areas. She's negotiated these awesome collaborations. I can't wait to hear more about partnerships between governments and NGOs and artists and chefs. She's created training programs, business plans, PR and marketing packages. She's a well-respected woman leader and a beautiful new partner to Planet Women. Over to you, Rocio. Wow, thank you, Christine. Uh, I'm so flattered to get to know you. I love the, how you started to be a pilot. I guess we were watching Top Gun at the same time, probably. I also wanted to be one, I just didn't become one. But thank you so much. So I'm gonna share my video. Uh, voy a estar, la primera parte de la presentación está traducida en el video. Eh, la segunda parte la voy a poner en el chat para las personas que solamente hablan español. Voy a poner la traducción en el chat. Ok, muchas gracias. Hello, my name is Rocio Torres Moguel. I was born and raised in Mexico City. I did my graduate studies in sustainable development of local communities in Okinawa, Japan. I have a bachelor's degree in graphic design, a minor in photography, and a master's in fine arts and museum studies. I worked in conservation of natural protected areas for over 15 years. During this time, I've been very fortunate to find unicorns every once in a while. Here's one example. This is a leatherback turtle. We met in a protected area in the coast of Oaxaca that is guarded by the Mexican army, given her condition as an endangered species. Being able to meet with one of these stunning creatures is as rare as finding a unicorn. Here, riding with a park ranger at the road that takes you to the pyramid of the Biosphere Reserve of Calakmul in Campeche, we found a young taper. You can see how funny he walks since the pavement feels weird on his paws. The taper is also an endangered species in Mexico. And this is Jock. That means black in Soke language. Jock is a six-year-old black jaguar, one of the most threatened carnivores in America who lives in a sanctuary in Chiapas that takes care of rescued animals from the Lacandona jungle. I feel I've been blessed by nature with several experiences as unique as this. But being able to encounter these marvelous animals and the amazing places where they live is just part of understanding the context of the different regions that indigenous communities inhabit. Their role is crucial for the conservation of biodiversity. In 2014, I created the Sustainable Business Area at the National Commission for Protected Areas of the Federal Government in Mexico. My goal was to create a network of indigenous groups that built the basis for the elaboration and sale of sustainable products and the provision of sustainable services. Characterized by generating significant income to local communities and participating in the conservation of ecosystems and culture of the protected areas where they live, I designed a tool called Sustainability Index that allowed me and my staff to evaluate productive projects from all the country to identify the success stories, and especially the factors that determine their progress or possible failure. The results of these evaluations provided information to assess the projects that presented areas of opportunity. We developed business plans with the active participation of each indigenous group and their objectives to strengthen their productive and governance skills. I set up a network of artists, designers, and business owners interested in collaborating with them to help showcase their products with the right public willing to pay a fair trade price. 
once they met the qualifications required by the sustainability index, they could obtain the collective seal of the protected area where they live. This shows clients that when they buy their products or hire their services, they contribute to the conservation of endangered species like the leather bacterial, the taper, and the jaguar. I've witnessed the leadership of indigenous women firsthand. Their commitment to their projects, their natural resources, and their families is admirable. Projects proposed by women in Mexico are given more points to obtain support from the federal government programs since the results show that 100% of the income they obtain goes directly to their families. In the case of men, it's around 80% or less. I've been able to accompany many women from the initial design of their projects all the way to being recognized with national awards given the high standards they meet with their products and services. In 2019, I found a perfect place to continue my professional passion to work with and for the communities that live in protected areas. I'm the director of the Colorado River Delta Program in Sonora Institute. And I oversee the work of a wonderful team of 42 people in Mexicali, Baja California. Sonora Institute is a national nonprofit with more than 30 years of experience in water and ecosystem conservation. We envision resilient communities living in harmony with the natural world, where flowing rivers and healthy landscapes enable all people and nature to thrive. Our work presents borders, bringing together diverse communities to promote dialogue about complex conservation issues that know no boundaries. Our work is guided by inclusivity and collaboration to create positive environmental change in the Western United States, Northwestern Mexico. Running from the Rockies to the Delta, the river covers seven states in the US and two in Mexico, where more than 40 million people rely on this water. The Colorado River Basin is the home to our three programs. In the US, our work extends through the West thanks to the Global Water Smart Program in Arizona and Colorado, where our workshops host elected officials, city planners, and community leaders to set policies that conserve water. The Santa Cruz River Program in Arizona focuses on tracking and protecting the health of the Santa Cruz River, which now flows year-round given our efforts with other local organizations. The Colorado River flowed freely from the Rockies to the sea until the dams were built to divert its flows. Cities grow with little planning in 1944 when the U.S. and Mexico signed the International Water Treaty. The ecosystem was not considered as a water user in Mexico, meaning all the rivers, water that flowed into the country was destined to cities, farmers, and industry. The impact 20 years later was that 80% of the native ecosystem was gone. The Colorado River was that 80% of the native ecosystem was gone. The Colorado River Delta Program encompasses four projects. One, the Mexicali Fluja Project, where we clean and rehabilitate the agricultural drains and turn them from open air wastelands into healthy and greener public urban wetlands. Two, the Arenitas Artificial Wetland Project treats 50% of the water of the city of Mexicali and has the purpose of improving the water quality and increasing the habitat for resident and migratory birds. Also, half of the treated water falls back into the Hardy River, a tributary of the Colorado, increasing its flow. Three, the Upper Estuary Project where we restore by dredging old river channels and incrementing fresh water flow to maintain the connection between the Colorado River and the Gulf of California. And four, the Laguna Grande project. We restored more than 700 acres in this site with approximately 200,000 native cottonwoods, willows, and mesquites in 10 years, making this area the largest and densest riparian forest along the region and home to more than 160 bird species and endangered mammals in Mexico, like the beaver. Our field staff from the local communities that live along the Colorado River take care of a nursery. They produce almost 40,000 plants a year for a restoration sites. The field supervisor is Celia Alvarado, who has been working with Sonoran Institute for almost 14 years and has become an expert bird guide in the region. We have a very successful environmental education program. 
more than 15,000 people have participated in our activities in the past six years. From students to families, local communities learn about the Colorado River through in-school presentations or guided field trip to our restoration sites. We launched the first free online introduction course to the Delta at the beginning of this year, and more than 500 students have already completed it. Sonora Institute has worked since the beginning of the program in restoration and ecotourism projects with the Kukapa, the people of the river the only indigenous community established at the Colorado River Delta. Their livelihood depended on the river, on fishing as their main activity to generate an income. Inocencia Gonzalez, one of their leaders, was born when the river had water. But as she grew up, she saw the river disappear. This summer, thanks to the minute 323, the binational agreement signed between the US and Mexico, and due to the work of Sonoran Institute with other organizations of the Razor River Alliance, the releases of water designed to mimic the river's natural spring flows began in May and will extend through early October. Inocencia didn't believe her daughter Antonia when she told her that the Colorado River had water again in June. Even though Innocencia had been sick for a while, she visited the river, which brought her much happiness and memories of her childhood. Innocencia passed away the last week of June. She saw her river with water again one last time, the week of full moon when the Colorado River finally met the sea of the upper Gulf of California. The unique project of Planet Woman presents an historic opportunity to Antonia with the possibility to see from the sky the Colorado River flow to the sea. I'd like to share with you an interview with Antonia of May of this year. Mi nombre es Antonia Torres González. Soy indígena Cucapá y soy promotor cultural de la etnia Cucapá. Desde 1979 promuevo la cultura y hoy en día tengo 22 años ya trabajando bien este, en el Museo Comunitario Cucapá. Doy talleres de artesanía y también soy cocinero tradicional. También manejo el grupo de canto y danza de los niños de Capá y jóvenes. Así promuevo la cultura y rescato un poco de lo que es nuestra cultura. Pues yo como hija de inocencia, pues valoro mucho lo que ella me ha enseñado. He valorado lo que significa para nosotros ser indígenas. Pues mi mamá, inocencia, pues ha sido una parte importante en mi vida. Este, porque yo crecí en el río. Entonces a mí me tocó ver los momentos más, más este, cuando el río estaba en su, pues, lleno, este, que no teníamos ningún problema, pensaba yo que pues jamás nos iba a hacer falta el agua del río, ¿verdad? He visto, como les digo, vi el río morir, ¿verdad? Y es, es muy este, triste para mí. Hablo del río y pues lloro siempre. Es, es imposible para mí no hacerlo porque... Pues es parte de, de lo que me han enseñado a amar esto. Entonces, sí es triste para mí. Bueno, pero ahora estoy contenta. <ríe> me da alegría. Hablé con mi mamá de acerca de que estaba llegando agua y le enseñé video. Pues se levantó de donde estaba, bien emocionada. Sí, se emocionó bastante. Entonces, yo sabía que era una buena noticia para ella. Pues ayer... Venía este, todavía incrédula porque dijo que, que no creía que había agua. No, pues para mi mamá creo que es todo. Es todo en su vida, es lo único que ha estado esperando por muchos años. Y que le hace darle vida también a ella, pues, en pensar, ¿verdad?, de que el agua regresa. Pues lo único que puedo decir es que cuiden lo que tenemos hoy y que después no vamos a lamentarnos de nuevamente, ¿verdad?, de, De lo que he lamentado mucho por muchos años, yo ya casi 30 años puedo decir que ha pasado de que el río dejó de, de fluir, entonces, y que ahora pues se ha tomado nue nuevamente vida y, y que lo debemos de cuidar. Gracias, Rocio. Thank you so much for inviting us to this wonderful project. Thank you. Thank you. Such a moving uh, video and such a great overview of the Sonoran Institute. 
who is one of our newest partners at Planet Women. And we're looking forward to partnering and collaborating with you on leadership and restoration and understanding a future that will be healthier for everyone from north to south and east to west. Speaking of the Four Corners region, Crystal Tully Cordova gave a presentation to the Planet Women Board of Directors last year. It was about a year ago. It's hard to believe. And she spoke in her own language and told us water is life. And I know that in many Native traditions, we're all relatives. And so as soon as she said that, I just felt like this woman's one of my sisters from, <laughs> from long ago. Crystal is the principal hydrologist with the Navajo Nation in their Department of Water Resources. She has a PhD in geology from the University of Utah and a Master of Water Resources uh, in Hydroscience from the University of New Mexico. And she also has an interdisciplinary graduate certification in sustainability studies from the University of Utah. So she's really working at a lot of intersections personally and professionally. When she showed her slides to us last September, she described her family life and the oppression of her peoples and the trauma that still exists from the boarding school experience. And then she talked about what's happening today with COVID uh, and what's happening when you don't have water to wash your hands and when you don't have water piped into your home. And she really woke us up. So I wanna thank you, Crystal, for educating and being open to communicating and speaking truth and for being a stellar scientist and woman leader that we all are gonna need now and into the future. I'm really excited to introduce you today. Over to you, Crystal Tully Cordova. Thank you for that kind introduction. Um, I'm happy to be here. Let me go ahead and start my screen sharing. Are you able to see my screen? Oh, there we go. I just need to maximize it. And start. So I'm Crystal Tuli Cordoba, and I am a part of the Navajo Nation Department of Water Resources, but I'm also a part of an organization called the Indigenous Women's Leadership Network. And this network is a growing opportunity for Indigenous women leaders through in the Colorado River Basin to be able to have um, tiered mentoring. Um, I'm very young, I graduated and then I came into my career. And so there's an opportunity for individuals like myself to be able to have the opportunity to uh, be mentored by leaders that are more senior than I, not necessarily just within my own tribal organization, but really across the basin and uh, some of the Indigenous Women Leadership Network people are here. Heather Tanana is a program coordinator for that organization. We also have uh, Lorelai Cloud, who's in attendance. And um, we have other individuals here as well. And it's important to have an understanding that this organization is unique in that it's not just um, about professional development, offering that tiered mentorship program, but it's also about the opportunity to embrace who we are and where we are from and the indigenous knowledge that we come equipped with uh, coming from the homelands that we do come from. I am from the Navajo Nation. It's the largest land-based tribe as well as the largest populated tribe in the United States located in the Four Corners region. We have land across all the Four Corners states. And it's important to have an understanding that um, through this connection that we have a lot of knowledge that I'll be sharing through the slide that is a combination of not only the scientific knowledge, but also the indigenous knowledge. And that's why I'm really uh, grateful to Planet Women to be able to uh, be inclusive of this knowledge. Sometimes within Western science, uh, there is opposition to acceptance for traditional ecological knowledge, but it's great to see that um, it's welcomed here at Planet Women, and especially with this project that uh, we're a part of and kicking off today. So the Colorado River Basin, uh, there are 30 tribes located 
in the Colorado River Basin. And you can see in the map on the right, um, the upper and the lower Colorado River Basin regions uh, located in the um, orange slash brownish color is are all the tribal lands located in this area. The Navajo Nation is unique in that it straddles both the upper and the lower Colorado River Basin. If you have any understanding about how management occurs within the basin, you can understand how complicated having lands on both sides of any type of border uh, provides some challenges. Um, but it's important to have an understanding that for tribes, water is life and that it's inclusive of many things, uh, not just for our well-being and being able to have, you know, uh, cleanliness, but it's also important for uh, our food that we eat, uh, for the water that we drink, for the agriculture that we grow, as well as um, the livestock that we may have for sustainability, but it's also inclusive of more than that. So of the natural ecosystems that are reliant across the areas, uh, it's important to know that all of these things we understand and accept as connected. And we understand that there are implications with a changing climate and continued drought conditions, how that can impact um, our livelihood and our vitality. It's important to have an understanding that we're talking about water in the Colorado River Basin, uh, but there are many tribal communities that do not have access to clean water. Our president of our Navajo Nation has been in the media often describing how in the peak of COVID, um, our people especially those people who haul water were impacted greatly um, with having high uh, incident rates with COVID-19. Of course, that has changed um, with continued vaccination, but definitely we were hard hit. And it's important to have that understanding that um, water above the surface has different vulnerabilities as well associated with drought. We know that the DROA uh, and different management practices addressing the drought, uh, management practices addressing the drought are in occurrence today. It's important to have an understanding that indigenous people um, have been impacted by drought. The vulnerability includes water haulers, public water systems, ranchers, dryland farmers, irrigators, as well as recreation, wildlife, and forests. As indigenous people, we often have the opportunity to have place-based knowledge, meaning we learn from the environment that we're in. And for many of us, maybe the water cycle was, is but a memory from a long time ago. But for indigenous people, it's really about seeing these things and it's a part of our livelihood of um, who we are today and how we are able to survive. And it's important to have this understanding because our relationship to our environment is very important and key um, that we're able to make this connection with the land. In the Navajo Nation, uh, the, here's a map showing the four sacred mountains. We have um, near Flagstaff, Doko Osli, and then we have Hesperus Peak, also known as the Bensa in our language, and Cisna Gini Blanca Peak up in Colorado. And uh, just west of Albuquerque, we have Mount Taylor, also called Tzotzil. And it's important that these are not just geographical um, features with changes in topography, but that's, there's so much more than that. And when I say that, what I'm referring to, uh, let's take, for example, uh, the mountain that is near Flagstaff, Doko Osleet. It is um, our Western area. So e -e -a is how you say it. It's representative of the color Fitzo, yellow. Uh, the protector for this mountain is Maitso, uh, wolf. And the mountain, is made, was made uh, with a blanket of abalone. And that's why we call it the chile. And having this understanding 
uh, to be able to see this mountain. This is from the southwestern portion of our Navajo Nation, a uh, place that my grandfather, my mother's father came from. And, you know, hearing those stories is important, but it's important that being able to see it from the sky can be able to give it a different perspective to where, you know, being able to go as a bird flies provides an opportunity to see things in a different lens. And that's why I'm excited to participate in this project where there's opportunity for recording to occur from different perspectives and using different media to be able to tell different stories from different um, age groups of people, meaning the youth as well as a, a woman leader as well. And having this perspective, not only by uh, choosing people that are differences in ages, but also choosing different media, there are different things that may stand out to different people. So there's options for audio recording or video recording or storytelling. There's so many options that we have today that many of our ancestors didn't have in the past. And so being able to um, compile this in a story map is a great opportunity. Um, we have, the Navajo Nation has used a story map to be able to get information out there. For our purposes, we've used a story map um, to address our water access issues and use NavajoSafeWater.org if you wanted to see um, how we've used the story map to integrate knowledge to the larger community, but I'm really grateful that this is an opportunity to be able to uh, have a description by different indigenous perspectives uh, and to be able to tell our stories within the Colorado River Basin. Thank you. Thank you, Crystal, so much. Really, really excited to have you as part of the team on the Overflight Project and really excited to see the Indigenous Women's Leadership Network take off. That's an initiative that's part of the Water and Tribes Initiative. And so we're at this moment where there are many voices at the table, which is something we haven't seen in recent history as well as we are today. The infrastructure bill is going forward. There's a lot of momentum and yet there's still a lot of work to be done right to make sure that Indigenous knowledge, modern science, the stories, the ways we're going to uh, adapt and survive the heat, we need to make sure the stories go forward into time so that our youth and our kids and their kids understand the decisions ahead of them. So really excited to see it all to come together. Thank you so much, Crystal, for being with us. And now you may be wondering, okay, this sounds pretty cool, um, pretty fun. How do I get involved? Um, you're all bringing different talents. We are on the heroine's journey, as it turns out, not the hero's journey. We all know the hero's journey. There's like one tough guy and like all this bad stuff keeps happening to him. And he's trying to figure out how to overcome the obstacles all alone. We're not doing it that way. The heroine's journey is not just about women. It's about men, women, and people of all identities and generations coming together with ideas and solutions and their own special talents. So I do not understand hydrology, but Crystal does. She is gonna bring talents that I can't bring to bear. I know how to write a poem or teach you a little bit about nature writing and I can fly a plane. I'm gonna bring some of that stuff. Each of us will bring different talents, networks, ideas, in-kind contributions, corporate connections, all of that. And here to kind of get a little more granular about the flying portion, I'm really excited to introduce you to Amber Gray. She's our Colorado River Overflight Project Aviation Operations Director. She's in charge of flight planning and mission control. She's a private pilot herself. She flies out of Santa Rosa, which is Charlie um, Brown's airport. If you ever get a chance to go visit, super cute if you like Snoopy. A lot of good Snoopy stuff there. She's a former claim automation and procedure specialist with State Farm. She earned her associates in music and then finished her business degree uh, with an emphasis in information systems. She's a member of the 99s International Organization of Women Pilots, and she flies a Beechcraft Sierra with her husband, Todd, all over California and the West. And I'm really happy she is directing this project. She's extremely organized and logistical in nature and a wonderful human being. Amber, over to you. 
Thank you very much, Christine. That's a very wonderful introduction. I appreciate that very much. So like Christine said, um, I'm Amber Gray and I'm the project manager. I'm handling the details of this project and all the nuts and bolts and keeping track of all the details. So Christine and I, uh, both being pilots, we happened to meet through the organization that she mentioned, the 99s, and that's an international organization for women pilots. Um, women pilots make up a roughly about 7% of the pilot population. It varies by year. I think since I've been a pilot, I think it was as low as 5% one year, might have been as high as 8% at another time, but it's still a very male dominated field. So the 99s as an organization serves a really key purpose just in helping to keep women pilots connected all around the world. And it gives us a structure for supporting each other. Um, we have scholarships and mentoring programs, but I think most importantly, we just have friendships and camaraderie and we've got a shoulder to lean on and somebody to talk to, um, maybe when training's not going quite as expected or if we have a challenge that we're facing in our careers or in our development as a pilot. So in that way, it's rather similar to the Indigenous Women's Leadership Network. It's a way for women to connect and support each other and help each other in our common goals. But as far as this project goes, both of those organizations, the 99s and the Indigenous Women's Leadership Network, they're both very key to the success of this project. So I've been looking for the volunteer women pilots that we're hoping to find for this project. I've been looking for them through the 99s. And then both Crystal and Heather have been key in helping find Indigenous women passengers and the youths who will accompany um, uh, as passengers on these flights. So there are other avenues for finding those elements of the passengers and the pilots, but using the 99s and the Indigenous Women's Leadership Network, they've been pivotal in just making this happen a lot faster than I thought it might happen. So first, I want to give a really big thank you to Crystal and Heather for your help in finding some passengers because I've got some good news coming with some stats about how things are unfolding and it's really amazing. So ladies, thank you both very much. But as far as how things are going right now, we've been working on this for a couple months now, kind of getting some foundational pieces in place, getting the word out, trying to do some recruitment. And as of this morning, we have seven volunteer women pilots, which is fantastic considering that this project is really still in its early stages. We have four indigenous women passengers confirmed so far with some more in the works uh, with Crystal and Heather are actively looking for more in very specific locations. I think we might have our first youth passenger lined up. If not, that's very close, but that's very good news. So I'm keeping track of all the pilots, the women, and the youths, and where everybody is. And as things line up, then we're able to start looking at putting flights together. So to have one of these flights actually happen, to boil it all down, I need three things. I need a pilot with access to a plane, or maybe they rent a plane or they own a plane. We need a woman indigenous leader who uh, wants to go on one of these flights with us, and we need one of the youth storytellers to come along. So once I've got those three things in one common location, we can get a flight scheduled and get that up in the air. So right now, considering the number of pilots that we have, as well of a, as a couple of requests that we got from Crystal and Heather to try to arrange flights out of a couple of very meaningful locations in looking at the pilots we have and those locations, uh, Christine, I hadn't even had a chance to update you on this yet, but I'm very excited to say I'm currently working on 10 flights. I was hoping maybe we'd get four or five or six all together, but right now we've got 10 flights with partial components in the works. So it looks very like we're very close to getting our first one, maybe two flights together. So for two of the flights, I have two components lined up. So as soon as I get that third person or pilot or whichever, uh, then we'll be able to actually get a flight booked and going and up in the air. So it looks like that first flight may happen very, very soon. So now if you would like to get involved in some way, whether you're a pilot or you uh, might want to be a passenger or you just have something that you might want to offer to this project, um, if, or if you also, if you have any questions, um, you can send an email to theoverflightproject at gmail.com. And I put that on my name on Zoom. So hopefully you can see that there. But there's going to be a follow-up email that you'll get after this presentation. Um, I'm guessing Jojo sometime in the next day or two that will go out. And that will have that email address in it, as well as a link to our story map, which um, is just getting started and it needs a little bit of updating because I just found out about some of these flights. So the flight portion needs to be updated. I've got some projected flights on there, but the real flights that might happen, I'm gonna be trying to get those updated in the next couple of days. But you'll have links to both that email address and that story map coming to you very soon. 
So uh, if you want to watch the progress of this project, you can do so via that story map. We'll be updating everything as things change there. And I believe that's it. Any questions, any other thoughts or anything, feel free to send me an email and I'll get back to you. So Christine, back to you. Thank you, Amber. And thank you for being a, a part of this dream to launch this project. I'm so thrilled that we already have so many segments lined up. Our goal is to fly over the whole Colorado River. And I know it's a long river and there are lots of challenges, not to mention really tall mountains. Uh, and if you're a pilot, you know, mountains are exciting, uh, but also can be a safety issue. So one of our top priorities is that anyone who goes up on a flight has extremely carefully thought out flight planning and safety protocols in place. As a pilot, I can tell you, not everyone wants to fly with me and it's not personal, I don't take it personally. Some people say, I've never been in a small plane, I'm not familiar, or I don't like flying at all. So I'm not, I'm not going up with anybody. You could be a Southwest Airlines pilot, I'm not going with you. And I really appreciate that. And for those people who are ready to take a flight and want to learn more, want to talk about it, discuss the options, talk through what happens in a flight, Amber is your woman. She can really get you uh, acclimated to what happens before, during, and after a flight and what a pilot has to learn in order to do this. Uh, it's extensive. And our training and our uh, and the testing from the Federal Aviation Administration is no joke. You have to do quite a lot of math uh, in, in flying anyways, but in preparing to fly, you have to really dust off those, those skills. So you can be assured that every flight will be really carefully thought out. And the most important thing is that the pilot is in control from a legal sense, but also from the project sense. And if she says, I don't like what's happening up here. We're going to abort this mission. Sorry, ladies, we'll do we'll do it some other day. She has all the right to do that. We're never going to push anyone to complete a mission just because we really want the pictures from that day. And as as Crystal said, the fact that we can use lots of different medium gives us a lot of flexibility and creativity to bring different voices forward. So what I'm going to be able to say as someone in her late 40s is going to be very different from someone who's 18, who's using TikTok or using Snapchat or using whatever they want to express themselves. And we want to be really inclusive of all of those voices and all of those methods. All of this information will be stored on the cloud in a safe way so that we don't lose sight of any of it. And it will serve as going down into the well for ideas and inspiration for artwork. So we are going to host some creative writing um, sessions. We're not sure if that'll be in person or via Zoom. We're still watching what's going on with the pandemic, obviously. And to that end, we're also going to be thinking about what do we need to do to make the cockpit as safe as possible with regard to the Delta variant and so on. So keep talking to us if you have ideas for distribution channels for stories like we just yesterday heard about a podcast that will feature this project or if there's a journalist that you know or someone who is connected in some way to some kind of way to get the word out we're really open and we'd love to work with community groups and museums and other um, indigenous and mexican and american groups that may not traditionally be seen as water groups. They might be a ballet company or, or a native dance company or a community center, but that is where water happens. It's in all of our bodies and it's in all of our lives and there's no way we have life on earth without it. So how can water not be a part of every single uh, company and organization that we rely on? I mean, Silicon Valley could not exist without water. Um, so I'm really, Delighted that you all came. And since we do have a couple of minutes, I'll go ahead and, and see if there are any questions for the group now. Um, if not, you can always follow up with Amber afterward. And we welcome you to be a pilot, a passenger, a storyteller, a community member, a supporter, a cheerleader, rah, rah, post our materials on social media. There's so many ways to help that are easy and take a few seconds. 
all the way up to you, you want to go up there yourself um, as a native leader. Thank you for being here with us today. I know everyone's busy and everyone has a lot to do. Really glad to be on board as partners with the Sonoran Institute on Restoration and with the Indigenous Women's Leadership Network and so many more are coming our way and signing up. So we'll be looking forward to announcing new partnerships, new flights, new pictures, and new updates as we go. And with that, I'm ready for takeoff. How about you? And if you want to take a